WVUT Vincennes, a part of Vincennes University Broadcasting. Good evening. In the news tonight, the cleanup continues tonight from Sunday night storms that ripped through the Midwest. And two people were killed and two others injured Sunday in a head-on collision near Bruceville. In sports, the NCAA men's basketball champion will be decided tonight and the Major League Baseball season is here. News Center 22 is next. <laughs> Authorities now say at least 27 people have been killed after a string of thunderstorms rolled across the Midwest yesterday. Authorities say most of the deaths are in Tennessee, where at least 23 people died after tornadoes hit five counties. The state highway patrol sent search dog teams to check debris along a 25-mile path from New Bern to Bradford. One witness there described seeing a tornado that was almost a mile wide. Meanwhile, a fire commander in Arkansas says about a half dozen tornadoes ripped through the state, with one destroying nearly half of the town of Marmaduke. In Indiana, the cleanup from Sunday night's severe storms continues this evening. Duke Energy, formerly Synergy PSI, says 116,000 of its customers lost power as a result of last night's storms. About 1,900 customers in Knox County remain without power this afternoon. The hardest hit areas were Vincennes, Princeton, Terre Haute, Seymour, Clarksville, Bedford, and Bloomington. In Gibson County, 16 miles of high tension line went down around Princeton. The storms caused widespread property damage and at least nine minor injuries. Straight line winds of over 60 miles an hour caused considerable damage in the Vincennes area Sunday night. Trees, business signs, and even roofs were blown off by high winds. Windows were blown out and at Shirley and Company at 226 Main Street. A portion of the brick facing on the Executive Inn was also blown down during the storm. The power was knocked out to Knox County Central Dispatch during the height of last night's storm. Problems starting uh, generated blacked out communications for about one hour. Emergency calls were routed to Davies County. A number of area schools delayed the start of classes this morning due to down power lines. Meanwhile, the damage in Davies County apparently was more severe than in Knox County. The Main Street Wesleyan Church in Washington was nearly destroyed. Two homes were blown over and Graver Post buildings near Odin suffered considerable wind damage. As you might recall, fire damaged one of Graver's main buildings just a few weeks ago. Washington radio station WAMW was knocked off the air after high winds damaged the station's transmitter. The storm that hit downtown Indianapolis last night blew windows out of a bank office tower and sent thousands of people scrambling for cover. The storm hit just after the end of a free outdoor concert by John Mellencamp on Monument Circle. It was part of the NCAA's men's basketball Final Four festivities, which wind up with the championship game tonight between UCLA and Florida at the nearby RCA Dome. No injuries were reported in Indianapolis. Two Vincennes University students were killed Sunday in a head-on collision between two pickup trucks on State Road 67 at Water Tower Road near Bruceville. Dead are 19-year-old Aaron Scott Hayes of Oaktown and 20-year-old Nathan Lee Miller of Bicknell. Hayes was driving and Miller was a passenger in a pickup truck that collided head-on with another truck occupied by 49-year-old Robert and 46-year-old Karen Shooter of Edwardsport. Robert Shooter is president of the Edwardsport Town Board. The Shooters are hospitalized at Good Samaritan Hospital in Vincennes. A hospital spokeswoman said late this afternoon that Robert is in serious condition while Karen is in fair condition. The Knox County Sheriff's Department says witnesses to the accident said Hayes' truck went left of center and hit the shooter vehicle head on. A Vincennes man died at Good Samaritan Hospital Saturday, a few hours after being struck by the handrail of a passing train on North 11th Street. 
Police say 57-year-old David Fox appeared to have been struck in the arm and in good condition shortly after the accident. Fox was admitted to Good Samaritan Hospital for observation. His condition grew worse and he died Saturday afternoon. Knox County Coroner Donnie Halter said today that an autopsy determined that Fox died from chest injuries. The search resumed today for four people missing after a van full of strangers who had met moments before at a bar, drove down a boat ramp, and plunged into the Kentucky side of the Ohio River. Two bodies have been recovered so far from the early Sunday morning accident. In Henderson, a 26-year-old Evansville woman survivor told police the Ford Explorer in which she was riding went down the Henderson boat ramp and into the water. Two women were found dead inside the SUV in the rivers about 75 feet from shore. The three trials surrounding the murders of the wife and children of former state trooper have cost Floyd County taxpayers about $1.8 million, and it may end up more than that. Floyd County Auditor said the two trials of David Cam, along with a trial of his co-defendant Charles Bonet, could total at least $2 million, not counting any additional appeals. The county's departments were warned last summer not to expect a funding increase, and county officials denied many requests for extra spending because of the trials. The Knox County Commissioners are still trying to figure out what to do with the fire-damaged Hillcrest building. The commissioners advertised for bids to repair the building to get an idea how much it would cost to repair the building. Problem is, no one submitted a bid. County officials are still considering tearing down the building. Duke Energy has closed its $9 billion acquisition of Cincinnati-based Synergy in a deal that creates one of the nation's largest utilities. Last May, Duke agreed to buy Synergy, creating a company with about 5.4 million customers and $70 billion in assets. Duke Power in the Carolinas, Cincinnati Gas and Electric in Ohio, Union Light, Heat and Power in Kentucky, and PSI Energy in Indiana are now known as Duke Energy. Ameristar Casinos is offering about $1.5 billion in cash to acquire Astar Corporation. Astar's holdings include Casino Astar in Evansville. Ameristar says the deal would form the fifth largest public owner and operated of gambling properties in the United States. Jenna Summers of Bicknell was crowned Miss Vincennes University 2006 Saturday. She is a freshman elementary education major at VU. Summers is a 2005 graduate of North Knox High School. She is the daughter of Brad and Pam Summers of Bicknell. Amanda Luckenbill of Vincennes was selected first runner-up. The Miss VU scholarship pageant is a preliminary step toward the Miss Indiana title. Miss VU receives a full tuition scholarship. The first runner-up receives a half tuition scholarship. WVUT-TV will rebroadcast the Miss VU scholarship program on April 8th at 8 p.m. The pageant was one of the highlights of VU's annual Spring Family Weekend. Still to come on News Center 22, the jury deliberating the fate of Zacharias Musawi has reached a verdict. And the military says that miraculously, no one was killed when a cargo jet crash landed today in Delaware. Stay with us. Marry a millionaire? Get real. Real college, real experience, real careers, really fast. Vincennes University preview days, April 21st or 22nd. Register at vinu.edu. Win the lottery? Get real. Real college, real experience, real careers, really fast. Vincent's University preview days, April 21st and 22nd. Go to vinu.edu. Zacharias Musawi is eligible for a death sentence for his role in the 9-11 attacks. That's the finding from a jury in Alexandria, Virginia in the case of the Al-Qaeda conspirator the only man tried in the U.S. in connection with 9-11. The jury concluded that Musawi's lies to FBI agents after his arrest, a month before the attacks, led directly to at least one death on 9-11. That means there will now be a second phase of the sentencing trial, in which jurors will decide between the death penalty and life in prison for Musawi. If they had decided he hadn't directly caused a death on 9-11, he would automatically have been sentenced to life. 
It's not an issue the Supreme Court could agree on, but the divided court has rejected an appeal from Jose Padilla. He's the U.S. citizen who was held for more than three years as an enemy combatant without traditional legal rights. Now that he's been transferred to the criminal court system, the court says his appeal is pointless. The top U.S. and British diplomats say time is running out to form a new unity government in Iraq. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Foreign Secretary Jack Straw took that message personally to Baghdad, leaning on politicians to break a month-old stalemate. Nick Robertson has the story from Baghdad. Smiling under pressure, Prime Minister Ibrahim al-Jafari met the U.S. Secretary of State and the British Foreign Secretary for 45 minutes, hearing their calls to quickly form a new Iraqi government. Although neither Condoleezza Rice nor Jack Straw publicly called for Jafari to step aside, his insistence at being the next Prime Minister is widely seen as the principal stumbling block to forming the next government. They need a Prime Minister who can be a unifying force. They need a Prime Minister who can uh, represent all interest and can run a sectarian government that is uh, capable and uh, able, of bringing, able to bring all people in. Rice and Straw thank President Jalal Talibani for his efforts to break the logjam. The unprecedented diplomatic double-teaming, an indication of frustration in London and Washington. We thought, uh, both Jack and I thought, that uh, given the commitment of the United States and the United Kingdom to Iraq's uh, future, the, the price that we've paid here, that it was important to come and uh, deliver a message that the time has come to end these negotiations and to form a government. The message delivered in turn to politicians of all stripes here. No government means no stability. A message that since the massive sectarian attack on a Shia shrine in Samara in February seems to strike a chord. The situation is still fragile and there must be a concerted effort to form this government. Otherwise, God forbid, a couple of more incidents like Samara really will ignite the whole country. Lunch was hosted by Abdulaziz al-Hakim, the principal Shia power broker, a key player behind the Jafari nomination. Just last week, he said they were already working as fast as they could, but he's less convinced than rice and straw. The new government can solve tensions. We are trying to do our best to speed up forming the new government, but we don't think it will stop the violence. The reality is options for Iraqi politicians are limited. The powerful Shia bloc that nominated Jafari has few other candidates and are under tremendous pressure not to break ranks. And broadly across the whole political spectrum, it's recognized that if the Shias are divided, any new government would be weak. Nick Robertson, CNN, Baghdad. Hostile fire and a road accident have both claimed the lives of U.S. troops in Iraq. The military says three Marines and a sailor were killed by hostile fire in Anbar province near the Syrian border. And five others died after their truck rolled over in a flash flood over the weekend, also in western Iraq. Two Marines and a sailor are missing. A top commander at Dover Air Force Base says it's a miracle that no one was more seriously hurt in today's cargo plane crash. The C-5 transport did a belly flop short of a runway after developing problems and doing a U-turn just after takeoff in Delaware. A squadron commander says it appears the huge plane, which is more than six stories high, slid along the ground as though it was making a water landing. All 17 people on board survived the crash. However, local hospital officials say 14 of the injured were covered with jet fuel and had to be decontaminated. None of the injuries are life-threatening. There's something new on the internet today. Six movie studios are starting to sell digital versions of films such as Brokeback Mountain and King Kong. While they can't be burned onto a disc, the movie is still seen as a step toward full digital distribution over the internet. A survey of airline quality shows lost luggage is likely to be customers' biggest gripe. The survey out today says people are boarding planes as much as before the 9-11 attacks, but the number of complaints jumped 17% last year over 2004. 
A spokesman for the Air Transport Association says most U.S. carriers realize their service has suffered and are trying to improve it. Our babies, our toddlers, are apparently too tubby. There's a word that more than a quarter million kids can't fit into standard car seats. Dr. Sanjay Gupta looked at this weighty problem. Riding in the car seat and watching the world go by is a feature of every kid's childhood. But finding a car seat to fit three-year-old Raphael was a surprisingly daunting task. Raphael's 47, 47 pounds and 37 inches long. I see kids his age taller, but they're lighter, much lighter than him. Raphael's always been on the heavier side. At just two years old, he already weighed 41 pounds. And now his weight rivals the average for a kid twice his age, which poses a problem when it comes to finding the right fit. You see, he's outgrown two of his car seats so far. The car seat is rated for infant to 100 pound kid up to 52 inches tall. It's too tight for him on the thigh. And his legs are hanging. And as you can see, he's not comfortable with it anymore. Rafael isn't alone. Most states have laws that children up to the age of three must be in a car seat. But there are about 283,000 children who are too big for the available types of car seats on the market. That's according to researchers at the Columbus Children's Research Institute. They looked at most of the child safety seats on the market and found that out of 92 types, only six car seats would be safe for a boy Raphael size. They're hard to find in stores and they come at a hefty price. The seats that would accommodate children at these higher weight ranges are the most expensive seats on the market. They start anywhere from $130 all the way up to $270. That's really one of the major problems is that these seats are too expensive for most families to afford. Well, if I can afford it, I would. Uh, yeah, I would, I would get that one with a safety one. Right now, Rafael has a booster seat that uses the car's built-in safety belt to strap him in. But experts say that's not safe enough. Look at these crash test videos that show how dangerous the wrong car seat can be, even in a low-impact crash. And they stress the importance of the right one, especially when it comes to one-, two-, or three-year-old kids. They're um, developmentally not capable of withstanding uh, the force of a crash, um, and they may also slip out um, under the adult seat belt. So a five-point harness just provides another level of security in keeping them in the seat. The researcher's conclusion? Parents should look for the five-point harness, follow the manufacturer's guidelines, and of course, make sure their child is comfortable for the long haul. But for bigger kids like Raphael, that's a tall order. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN, Des Moines, Iowa. Even cell phone users say cell phone users are rude. But of course, that goes for the other guy. An Associated Press AOL Pew poll says almost 9 in 10 say they encounter others using their phones in an annoying way. One woman says she hears young people talking about personal things she doesn't want to know about. Still to come on News Center 22, Amy Reef has this evening's weather. Coming up this week on 22 Magazine, we'll learn more about three advanced manufacturing students at Vincennes University who recently placed first, second, and third in a recent national technology competition. And Dan Ravelette, Vincennes Mayor Terry Mooney's chief of staff, will be here to talk about a new project to get school kids to color and remember the city's history. The next time on 22 Magazine, Saturday night at 7.30 on WVUT. Well, Amy, the severe storms hit us hard yesterday. Are there any more on the way? Well, while we're continuing to hold on to the cloudy skies, the worst is over. We're going to have some sunny skies for the next couple of days. Good evening, everyone. As we take a look outside, we currently have cloudy skies and 49 degrees. Wind is out of the northwest at 23 miles per hour. The humidity is at 69%, and the barometric pressure is at 30.01 and steady. Now let's take a look at some area temperatures. Cloudy all around. Evansville is at 50 degrees. Sullivan at 48. Over in Illinois, Ani also at 48. And Robinson is at 49. 
Now let's take a look at our national temperature map. Cooler temperatures in the northeast and the midwest as a low pressure system continues to hover over that region of the state. Currently we have international falls at 36 degrees. Now in the northwest, temperatures are averaging in the 50s as they're experiencing some wet weather out there. Seattle, Washington currently at 59 degrees. And in the deep south, there in the red, as conditions are continuing to heat up, Brownsville, Texas is at 87. Now let's take a look at our surface map. Pretty active in the northeast as severe thunderstorms continue to push their way out along the coast. Moving to the midwest, not so much to speak of over there except for this low pressure system generating in some cooler temperatures and a little bit of wind. But if you're on your way to Indy for the final four, driving conditions should be rather nice. As we take a look to the south, just a few light showers continue to push their way east as the storm starts to taper off. But there is a chance for the redevelopment of some of the more severe thunderstorms until this cold front continues to push its way east and clears the coast. For the midsection of our country, we have a couple areas of high pressure generating sunny skies and warmer temperatures, giving them the chance to dry out just a little, but not for long. As we look our way out to the west, we have another area of low pressure moving its way inland, generating some precipitation all along the west coast. That's going to move its way into the Wabash Valley sometime later this week. But for now, we can enjoy the sunny skies. Let's take a look at your forecast. Tonight, mostly clear with a low of 31. Tomorrow night, sunny with a high of 58. And tomorrow night, mostly clear with a low of 36. For your extended forecast, Wednesday, partly cloudy with a high of 62 and a low of 44. Thursday, thunderstorms likely with a high of 61, a low of 58. And on Friday, thunderstorms likely again with a high of 70 and a low of 50. And Kurt, that's a look at your weather. Thanks, Amy. Still to come on News Center 22, Kristen Miller has the latest from the world of sports. Invited to a birthday party when the Juilliard School celebrates its centennial with musical greats making great music. Next time on Live from Lincoln Center. It's down to one. Good evening, everyone, for TV 22 Sports. I'm Kristen Miller. The NCAA men's basketball champion will be crowned at Indianapolis later today. The UCLA Bruins will be gunning for their record 12th national championship when they take on the Florida Gators. The Gators have been to the title game once before when they lost to Michigan State six years ago. The Maryland Terrapins and Duke Blue Devils will practice today in preparation for tomorrow's NCAA Women's Basketball Championship game at Boston. The Terps earned their first trip to the title game by downing North Carolina 81-70 last night before the Blue Devils silenced LSU 64-45. Duke is in the championship game for the second time. The Basketball Hall of Fame is about to include the round mound of rebound and the human highlight reel. Former NBA All-Star forwards Charles Barkley and Dominique Wilkins are among six people who will make up the Hall's class of 2006. Barkley was named to 11 All-Star teams and is a member of the NBA's 50th anniversary team. Wilkins spent most of his career with the Atlanta Hawks. In the NBA yesterday, the Detroit Pistons have wrapped up the top seed in the NBA's Eastern Conference playoffs with a comeback win over another division leader. Chauncey Billups scored 28 of his 35 points in the second half as the Pistons knocked off the Phoenix Suns 109 and 102. The Suns lost for the fifth time in nine games despite shooting 68% in the first half. Sean Marion's 32 points led Phoenix. Kobe Bryant scored 43 points and the Los Angeles Lakers dominated the third quarter of a 104 to 88 win over Houston. Brian shot 19 for 32 and finished with six assists as the Lakers moved five games over 500. It's the 23rd time Bryant has scored at least 40 points this season, tying the team record set by Eldrin Baylor in the 1963. Yao Ming led the Rockets with 33 points and 16 rebounds. 
From our test scored 26 points and the Sacramento Kings beat the Los Angeles Clippers for the 12th straight time, 106 to 96. Brad Miller had 25 points and nine rebounds. Bobby Bibby had 22 points and seven assists for the Kings, who maintained their eighth place standing in the Western Conference. The Kings are two games ahead of New Orleans and a game and a half behind seventh place Lakers. The Chicago White Sox began their Major League Baseball season in much the same manner in which they finished the 2005 campaign. The White Sox raised their first World Series banner since 1918 and then whacked the Cleveland Indians 10-4. Jim Tomey hit a two-run home run. The team endured a two-hour, 57-minute rain delay. Indian starter C.Z. Sabathia left the game with a strained right abdominal injury in the third inning. Then came a long rain delay. At the ballparks this afternoon, the Cubs and Cardinals are well on their way to opening day wins. In Cincinnati, the Cubs are handling and Reds 12-6 after six innings. Meanwhile, the Cardinals are pounding the Phillies 13-3. Elsewhere in the National League, Xavier Nady made a great first impression while helping the New York Mets win their season opener 3-2 over Washington. Nady went 4-4 four four in his Mets debut, including an RBI double that put the Mets ahead to stay. And Milwaukee beat Pittsburgh 5-2. Over in the American League, Boston leads Texas 7-2, and it's Baltimore 7, Tampa Bay 6 in the bottom of the sixth inning. Vincent University continued its hot streak Sunday with a doubleheader sweep of Brescia at the VU Diamond. The Blazers won the first game 10-7 and then erupted for 12 runs in the first inning of Game 2 en route to a 15-5 win that was shortened to five innings by the 10-run rule. Freshman Kyle Lynn led the hit parade for VU. He tripled and doubled twice to drive in four runs in the first game. He doubled twice and drove in three in the second game. The Trailblazers are at DePaul University Thursday. Phil Mickelson is coming into this week's Masters with a lot of golf momentum. Mickelson won his Eighth third consecutive Bell South Bird. Classic in a runaway Tied fashion with a final day. round 65. Mickelson finished 28 oh, under par to win the tournament by 13 shots rolling, over Jose Maria Olazabal and Zach Johnson. Straight Mickelson straight finished down. the week with 31 birdies, just one off of PGA Tour record. Who cares how they market Kari them? Webb has captured the Kraft Nabisco Championship, the first major of the LPGA season. Webb won a sudden death playoff against Lorena Ochoa with a birdie on the first playoff hole. Both finished at nine under 279. Ochoa forced the playoff with an eagle three on the final hole of regulation. Webb erased a seven-shot deficit Charlie on the Webb final day to win. Money winner since back in the, years. the French Open is about to join the Australian and U.S. Opens by offering equal prize money to the men's and women's champions for the first time. The French Tennis Federation says each singles champ will receive $1.1 million. Wimbledon remains the only Grand Slam tournament that pays the men's winner more than the women's champ. And Kurt? That's a look at sports. Thanks, Kristen. Still to come in New Center 22, a look at what was hot and ice cold at the movies this weekend. We are global citizens now. The borders don't protect anybody. We're all in this together. Right now, a child is dying every 30 seconds from malaria, and it is getting worse. Malaria has been eradicated in the United States and is back now. Here they come. Oh my God. How the mosquitoes manage to cause as much catastrophe and death in this world today is just truly amazing. <laughs> Ice Age, The Meltdown, made more than the combined total of all the movies in the top 10, selling $114 million worth of tickets in North America. It was followed by the thriller Inside Man, which slid from its top position the week before, earning $15.7 million. 
and urban romantic comedy ATL started its opening week in the third slot, raking in $12.5 million. That's $3 million more than the studio expected to make. And that's all for this evening. Join us again tomorrow for Amy Reef and Kristen Miller. I'm Kurt Maddox. Good night. <laughs>